Now, those are very important metrics. How many sales you did can already tell you a prediction of some sort, but it's not new information. Most likely, if you know that you're not selling real, a lot, you already know that you're not selling a lot. And so there's nothing real empowering about that. And that's where I want to, I really want to talk about this concept of what's empowering versus what's not. It's time to get inside your own head. Begin with the psychology behind your behaviors and fuse it with an acute understanding of self-awareness, emotion, storytelling, body language, and more. Then look at it all through the lens of the latest neuroscience research, broken down to its most digestible form. And you've arrived. Enhanced messaging, deeper connection, heightened influence, and a greater impact on the world. Welcome to the neuro side of influence and leadership with Rene Rodriguez. Hey there, welcome to this episode of the neuro side of influence and leadership. And we are actually here in the new studio, which is pretty fun. The background looks kind of the same, but we've got, man, a lot of fun stuff going on in here. So we're gonna be having some fun, hopefully um, changing things up a bit and coming up soon, we'll probably have some guests that we're gonna be bringing on. So this week, I wanna talk about something that's just been, I think, I've been talking about it a lot, so I wanted to, to, to continue the conversation. It's this concept of the law of averages. And it's such a basic understanding when you're in the world of selling and persuasion and even running a business is what is this law of averages? And it's basically say, says that for everything that we engage in, that we're going to get a ratio of results. And the bigger, if you understand statistics, the bigger the population of the data. I mean, the more you do it, it will do what's called a regression to the mean or the mean being the average. And so this law of averages is basically understanding what are the activities that really generate results for you. If you're in sales, it's usually picking up the phone at some point, making phone calls and booking appointments and doing presentations. Those are things that you can really readily, more easily control. And if you can get an average conversion of those, how one translates to the other, then I can control those points of my day, that activity, if you will, and that activity will generate a result, a predicted result. And then if you can follow that a little bit further into understanding how does that lead to tangible income, meaning an application or a, a sales order, uh, a purchase, a check, a closing of some sort, then you can start predicting what behaviors and what activities I can do now that will generate results later. So let's go a little bit further in that. Let's, let's think you know, from the perspective of how do I predict it? So we got to we got to think about this concept of lagging and leading indicators. Okay, so there's indicators that are lagging, and there's ones that are leading. So think about it from this perspective. So anything that is a, a lagging indicator would be something that is historical. It's a metric that tells you how you did, the number of sales that you made, your income, like your current income, like how much money you made last month, how many orders you closed. Those are things that are historical, like your blood pressure. It's already there. It's something that's in the past. The moment you look at it, it's in the history. And so it's a lagging indicator. Now, those are very important metrics. How many sales you did can already tell you a prediction of some sort, but it's not new information. Most likely, if you know that you're not selling real, a lot, you already know that you're not selling a lot. And so there's nothing real empowering about that. And that's where I, wanna, I really want to talk about this concept of what's empowering versus what's not. And so a leading indicator is a, is a metric, a number today, that predicts a number tomorrow. Something that if you look at it today, we can kind of understand what's going to happen tomorrow. And that exercise to understand that for your business is a critical one and not always easy. Some industries are a lot easier. You can predict phone calls. You can predict appointments, talk tos. You can predict um, you know, how many trade shows you attend. There's all sorts of things that you can use to predict, you know, even articles. Marketing is based on this. How many ads? How many clicks? How many uh, uh, posts on social media? That to me is is a, is a is a marketing sort of skill set. It's not. I wouldn't say it's my area. I'm not, I would not. Wouldn't say it's just not my area of expertise. I have other people that I work with that really that is their area. But the concept is the same. When they understand how many of certain activity leads to certain things, like you know cost per lead, then they can calculate. Okay, you spend X and you generate X. I just got a message from somebody saying that they 
spent thirty thousand dollars, you know, trying to sell me on doing this. They, they, their ad spend was thirty thousand dollars, but it produced four hundred eighty thousand dollars of income. It's like well, somebody says, "Well, it's thirty thousand. I said, "Well, no, it's four hundred eighty thousand of, of of income." You got to think about it from that perspective. And the thirty thousand is the effort. Now, what's interesting about marketing? The effort is financial effort. In sales, it might be three hundred phone calls to generate that. Well, that's a physical and mental and emotional effort. That's surprisingly a lot of people just don't like to do. And so that is a, another concept that has to be dealt with. And we have to look at what is it about this whole process that, that holds us back from doing things. There's also leadership activities that generate results. We talk about leadership metrics in terms of, what, in like, for example, a hallway walk. And what's your hallway walk? We'll probably do a whole segment just on that. But most leaders don't see people and don't get a chance to interact with people unless they're in the same meeting. And that meeting is not all that big. It's usually a leadership team and maybe an extended leadership team. But then where they see the people that they need to influence or people that they need to sort of affect, they're usually in the hallway. And so how do you walk a hallway? Do you have your head down or do you have it up? Are you on your phone? Do you look busy? Or are you stopping and saying hello? And so we've always urged, can you get one hallway interaction per day? Just one hallway interaction per day. What's the overall result of that? So there's an average to that. A little bit harder to measure. You're going to have to have some faith and belief. Do you believe that conversations and things like that lead to better relationships and less turnover? Well, the research says that, so it's pretty sure, but do you believe it? And so going back to, to the other piece, lagging and leading indicators. Best way to understand a leading indicator, if you've ever heard of the canary in the coal mine example. So the coal miners used to go into the coal mine, and they would bring a canary with them. And the canary was known to have a smaller, weaker respiratory system. And if you're in a coal mine, Carbon dioxide or common, uh, carbon monoxide, yeah, one of those two, <laughs> getting that. But the, the fumes that were generated down there, if you weren't, if you inhaled too much of them or you started losing oxygen or the ratio was off, you could die, but you didn't know it was happening. So they needed some sort of leading indicator. And so they bring this poor canary down there. And if the canary had a hard time breathing or keeled over and died, they knew it was time to leave. And so that was their leading indicator. When you're thinking about from a sales perspective, what are the leading indicators in your business? What are the things that those canaries that are going to say, hey, that this is happening, therefore that's happening? And I do a lot of work in the mortgage real estate industry. So you can tell by uh, how many credit pulls were done. Did you pull credit? And you can measure how many credit pulls lead to an actual application. And then, then there's a whole other challenge of defining terms, defining what a lead is. You want to you want to cause an issue in, in a marketing and sales meeting. Say, hey, well, how do we define a lead? Or even add IT in there who's building the technology to surround it and track it. And so how are you defining a lead? And you're going to see three different definitions of leads. You're going to see people that talk about leads that meaning uh, like a salesperson is going to say somebody who has expressed interest. And then their job is to qualify the lead, which means they have to have the ability, the interest, right? The desire, ability, the money, and the want. And the need, excuse me, the third. Those three things. That's how salespeople look at leads. Marketing people look at leads as they've, they, they, they express an interest maybe online of some sort. Maybe they clicked on something. Maybe they downloaded a white paper. The good ones understand that they need to work with sales. And the good salespeople know that they need to work with, with marketing. But too often those are siloed. There's marketing says, well, we generated clicks. You know, screw you. You got your leads. You're just not converting. And sales are saying, those aren't leads. Those are just names and numbers that they actually breathed on the on the tab or maybe the elbow hit the keyboard and you're saying that's a lead. You know, so you, you don't want to live in a siloed organization when it's that way. And if you do have that silo going on, you're going to want to address it because the new sales organizations, the most effective ones, look at sales, marketing and service, customer service as an integrated approach, as an integrated experience and they all need to work together hand in hand to to create that ultimate customer experience. And so you're looking at so those leads, so credit pulls is one for mortgage industry. Real estate would be how many listing appointments and agreements you have, and you know maybe how many open houses. Now people know that you know in, in real estate, open houses really aren't what sell the homes. They generate more leads, and those leads are good because they might you know an open house from someone else might generate a lead from my house that you're doing an open house for. And so you have to understand that's all part of the process. But if you don't have leads, you got to engage in those things. And so you're looking in. Uh, when I sold cookware, it was how many trade shows could we do and how many dinner slips could we fill out at the trade show? 
That was our metric. And so we measured with a ruler. How high was that stack of leads? We weren't trying to book appointments. We weren't trying to sell the product at the trade show. We were just offering a free dinner that I could go cook. And that we knew had a high conversion ratio. Once I was cooking, we knew that it was good. And so how many bag of vegetables did we buy? You know, those are leading indicators. And then we knew we had to book the appointment. So how many phone calls and dials? So you get where I'm going with this. But if you're not measuring and tracking, you don't have the numbers to be able to predict. A lot of you probably listening to this have an intuitive sense. If you're successful in what you're doing, you're making the money that you want, then you probably have some intuitive sense of what and how many you're doing. And you probably start feeling a sense of stress when you're not doing the right activities. That anxiety starts to go up. But you're also creating the anxiety from the unknown. And I want to stress that. You don't need to have that unknown if you start measuring. But the measurement takes discipline, it takes systems, and it takes some sort of a time to be able to practice. Now, the paradox of that is that it takes time to measure, but it also saves you time once you do that. So it is something that does yield a lot of benefits in that. So going back to leading indicators, lagging indicators. Think about it from this perspective, okay? You go into the doctor, and the doctor says, hey, let's check your blood pressure. At a very important metric. I mean, this is critical. And the doctor says, all right, John, your blood pressure is a little bit high. I'm going to need you to lower it for me, please. And John looks at you like, well, number one, that's not news to John that he needs to have low blood pressure. That is not new. So he's not going, oh, wow, doc, <laughs> low blood pressure. I never knew that. Thanks. Hold on a second. And, and he lowers it. No. One, he doesn't. He does. He knows that that's already something. So it's not news that it should be lower. Two, you're giving him a metric that he has no control, immediate direct control over. And this is something I learned with working with the Gallup organization. We worked alongside for about eight years in several different projects. And with their team, they would always say that the most important thing that they were trying to measure are measurements that could create. Could you? Could you level some sort of? Could they cause change? Does the metric help you cause change? And that's what I really want you to think about. Does this metric help me cause change? So getting a law of averages around a metric that doesn't cause change and doesn't really do anything. Well, my, my average blood pressure is X. So you go to the doctor. Again, blood pressure is high. Please lower it. You're not going to be like, wow, doc, that was amazing. You're a genius. Let me lower it. No, your question is, is how? How do I do this? And so if you're a sales manager and you have one of your uh, underperforming sales reps or people that work for you and say, hey, wow, Johnny, your uh, sales are low. Go sell more. Johnny's not going to go, oh my, sell more. I never, huh, wow, I never ever thought about going to sell more. What a genius idea. I mean, never thought about it. I mean, wow, okay, you know what? Maybe I should go out and sell more. No, that's not going to happen. And so what is going to happen is they're going to feel disempowered, they're going to feel frustrated, and they're going to feel like you aren't listening. And so here's the thing. They're going to, they're going to say, okay, sell more. I know. I, my bank account is telling me. My wife or my husband, they're telling me. My creditors are telling me I'm not selling enough. What do I do? Now, if you're thinking, well, I've been telling them to do X, Y, and Z, well, you might have the wrong people. Right? There's a whole side of, of this whole equation run. The hiring part, and maybe we should probably do a podcast on that, is you know, who you should have in terms of from a sales perspective and who are the people that you need to hire. But assuming you've hired the right person and not doing that, then you got to ask yourself, am I engaging them in the, in the right way as a leader? And so that's the ownership side of this. And we do subscribe to taking full ownership over this. If people aren't listening, don't, don't, don't tell them that they need to listen more. you got to get better and more entertaining. My workshops, especially my longer ones, we've got two and three day workshops, sometimes long ones. We've got 50 people in the room and I'll walk around and say, hey, by the way, here are the rules. If you want to fall asleep, fall asleep. Go ahead. God, if you want to lay on the floor and you end up falling asleep, more power to you. All that means to me is that I was not engaging enough. And if I'm boring, you are welcome to fall asleep. That does a couple of things. One is it puts the onus on me. It takes the pressure off of them, but it shows that I'm, I'm willing to step up to the plate here. And it also says, okay, I mean, it kind of creates a partnership here, but it creates the freedom. If they want to fall asleep, and some people have bad backs, they need to lay, I've had people lay down in the middle of the floor 100% engaged. Helps their ADD, if they have ADD, kind of move around a little bit. Helps their back, relieve pain, so that they're, they're not thinking about their back, and they're listening more to the content. And 
all of those elements. But why do I share that? Because if you're a sales manager and they're not listening to the things you're asking, so maybe you need to tar- start a different approach. Maybe you need to take some of these concepts I'm talking about and tell the same story. So if you're saying, hey, let your sales or logo sell more, you got to think of a different approach. So let's look at the Mail Clinic. The Mail Clinic has a very different approach to this. The Mail Clinic, you go in and they're going to check your blood pressure because that's a vital, very important thing. It tells you if you're alive, dead, sick, or healthy. And if the blood pressure is low, this is their response. John, or if it's high, this is their response. John, okay, your blood pressure is a little bit high. Not a problem. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to follow this two-step process for about 10, 15 minutes. I want you to breathe in for three seconds, and I want you to breathe out for four. This is a three in and four out metric, okay? Something that they can control. You're going to breathe in. We're going to practice together one time, John. So modeling and coaching, critical management, leadership behavior. And then, okay, so John, that was two in and one out. I need three seconds in and four seconds out. And he goes three seconds in and four seconds out. Perfect, John. Just like that. Do that for about 10 to 15 minutes. I'll be back. Now, doctor comes back in about 10, 15 minutes. What has magically happened to the blood pressure? It has lowered. Why? Because they gave him a metric. Breathing. Seconds where I'm breathing. <laughs> Something they can control immediately. Breathe in for a second, Renee. <sighs> Hold your breath. <gasps> right? We can control that stuff. <sighs> and a metric that indirectly starts to affect it. So, What you should be thinking about right now is saying, what's the breathing of my success? What's the breathing of sales? What's the breathing of leadership? What is the breathing of my influence? What's the breathing of my social media? What are the breathing of my marketing efforts? Those things that I have to do every day consistently in a certain way that indirectly start affecting my sales and the outcomes and the key performance indicators that are critical to me. What is the breathing, the things that I can control? In a sales process that we talk about a lot, it's called PAPCAR, P-A-P-C-A-R. There's six activities that lead to almost every sales process. And if this is in a, a, a direct sale or not a complex sale, a complex sale meaning you have 20 people that can say no, one that can say yes, organizations, long sales cycle times, we're talking more in a direct selling environment. It's PAPCAR, P-A-P-C-A-R, write it down, and it's prospecting. PAPCAR is, think of it as someone's name, prospecting appointments, right? I prospect, set appointments, and then I present. Prospect, appointments, present. Then I close, and then aftercare, and then referrals. Prospecting, appointments, presentation, closing, aftercare, referrals. PAPCAR. Those are six money-making activities. Is what I call them for years. They aren't new. It's just in a code layer. It's something easy to remember. But you can measure how many Times you're doing the activity of prospecting to generate a lead. That's the outcome of prospecting, is generating a lead. And there's going to be a law of averages associated to that. There's going to be a law of averages to certain activities. If you're doing BNI events or you're doing some sort of networking event that is the wrong group, maybe there's a conversion ratio that isn't good. If you're prospecting by calling the calling and dialing, but you're dialing at 3 a.m., probably the talk to ratio isn't going to be that high. So Maybe you're calling during dinner, probably the wrong time. So you got to find what activities and start getting really granular about it. Because then you start finding, well, the best time to book appointments is this for me. And so that law of averages of prospecting to appointments, you can measure that, right? Or how many leads that, that you generate to then generate the appointment. And so you'll have to sort of use that as your foundational template to say, what is your sales process? But I guarantee you, if you're in sales, you have to prospect. You have to set appointments. You have to present some sort of value. You've got to close. Now, aftercare, that's that's optional. But the reason we focus on aftercare is because buyer's remorse, service, getting rated, keeping up with your brand promise, all the things that matter in a transparent world that we're in today happen through aftercare. The goal of aftercare is to create a wow experience. And so that wow experience is where you've listened to the customer. They feel like you've heard them. And you've delivered what they've asked. And that is where really things start to take off. And if you do that right, getting a referral is easy. They want to refer you. They're giving you a gift of working with you. And so you start thinking about prospecting, appointments, presentation, closing, aftercare, and referrals. You have to think about the outcome of each. So I'm going to tell you those. You prospect to generate leads. You take the lead. You set the appointment. That's the activity. What do you know? 
about the what's the outcome of the act, of the activity of setting appointments? A date, time, and a place. DTP. Remember, just DTP. I'm on the phone. I'm setting the appointments. I just got to get a date, time, and a place. I'm not trying to close a deal. Don't try to do that. Unless you have a very low ticket item that you're always on the phone and you're in telemarketing, most of the time you got to get the appointment so that you can set yourself up in the best place to be able to present your value. So for me, when I'm selling amplifies or I'm selling, you know, if I'm doing a presentation or a keynote, our prices are high er than the competition. But so now I'm not going to try to close that over the phone. I want to get on Zoom call. If you're watching the video of this, you see that there's a studio involved and there's I can press a button and play videos and I can really demonstrate the full value and the full experience of what we're talking about. But I'm not going to do that over the phone typically. Typically, that's something that I want to do in a Zoom environment or some environment that really gives me something to work with and where I can really present my full value. So once I do that, I've presented the value. Now I have to engage in the activity of closing. So, present, so the presentation of value is, sorry, is three things you have to achieve. It's CDT, credibility, show that you're credible in what you're talking about, differentiate yourself in some sort of way, and gain their trust. If you are credible, you've differentiated and gained trust, closing's easy. If you are not credible, you are the same as everyone else, and they don't trust you, I don't care how good your closing script is. It's just not working. So focus on presentation of value that you can articulate the need of what you're trying to, the, the need of your client in a way that shows the value of it that far exceeds the cost of doing business. That's the full goal. My sales manager first, when we first started selling cookware, would come in and said, I want you to imagine that you have this teeny little bitty set of cookware that like a Ken or Barbie could play with. And they've got this huge pile of money. And if you have zero presentation, you're basically saying, hey, can I sell you this plastic little pan for that you know, $2,500? They're saying, no way. But through presentation, you show them the value of the surgical stainless steel that we're using, the seven layers of metal, the ability to cook without any water, retaining 98% of the vitamins and minerals, cooking meats and chicken, frying chicken without any fat, grease, or oil, the health benefits, and you'd go on and on and on. That, that cookware starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and shinier and more beautiful and represent a lifestyle change. And that pile of money becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because you're comparing it to the value that you've communicated through presentation. When the value far exceeds the cost, meaning the value of the cookware is much larger than the size of the pile of money, that's when you can engage in the exchange or the close. And usually it's a formality. I'll trade you that money for this value. And they go, easy deal. It's a no-brainer. Go back to how many no-brain activities you've been a part of. Like, how much of a no-brainer was it? It's like, why wouldn't I do that? That's the goal of your presentation. You need to be able to do that. And so this law of averages should generate how many presentations to how many closes. You should know that number and then strive for those presentations. What I love about me measuring appointments and presentations is that it's tangible. You can see it on my calendar. right? I can see it there. How many presentations am I doing? If I don't have a lot of presentations, I already know we aren't closing a lot of deals. If I see my calendar riddled with presentations and appointments, people wanting to learn about what we do, I know our income is going to be okay, if not great. So being able to manage those pieces, knowing and trusting and believing in the law of averages. So I want to leave you with something else here. though. There's um, How do we deal with that little voice inside? right? That little voice that said, no, 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 no that's not going to work. No, you should probably go do this. Check your email instead. Go do X, Y, and Z. Or it's just not going to work. Your presentation sucks, Renee. You're not good at this, X, Y, and Z. What I learned, because I did not have a big self-esteem, and I can make an argument that still certain things that I'm super struggling with, especially when it comes to video and things like that, is I learned early on not to listen to my inner voice and to trust the law of averages more. Because what I realized was that the law of averages didn't listen, didn't listen to the voice, didn't care what the voice said. It just produced a, a result. And if I just trusted the law of averages more, my voice over time would start to drown out. The one that says, don't do that, it's not going to work. And law of averages say, yes, it does. And then you would listen to the activity, law of averages, and you would do it. And all of a sudden, the voice would be like, well, I thought it wouldn't work. Maybe this time. Maybe you got lucky. And then you do it again. And after a while, that voice loses credibility. So that inner voice for me has lost a lot of credibility. I don't trust it anymore. I trust the law of averages. 
I trust the data. And when you can trust the data over your own inner self-limiting beliefs, it's a really powerful place to be. It doesn't happen overnight. But just like anything of value, you got to put work into it. you got to push forward, push forward through it. If you're new in sales, this is what Jim Rohn always used to say. Make up in numbers what you lack in skill. The numbers are on your side. If you are new, just do more presentations. Fail more often. Work harder. Get up earlier. Do whatever you have to do. The same way if you're trying to make a team in sports. Be the first in the gym and the last to leave. We know all the people that are winning are the ones that are doing those kinds of mental exercises. It's no different in sales. And so, and here's the best part, is the learning curve is pretty fast and it depends, and you are in control of it. I always tell people is that your learning curve is as fast or as slow as you want it to be based on how often you step up to the plate and take a shot at this. So here's my urge. Law of averages is in your favor. In the beginning, it's going to be a much lower average. But as you push forward, it will get better over time. And if you're looking for a quick win, sorry, you're in the wrong industry. You're in the wrong game. Play the long game. Play the career game. Play the lifelong game. Learn for a lifetime. Try for a lifetime. Make mistakes as if you're in there for forever. Continue to learn. And I promise you, this will pay off. So, law of averages, PAP car, all these things. Get out there and do that. And if you're not in sales, think about teaching your children the ability to continue to practice something. Learn something. Try a sport. It works in free throws. It works in sports. It works in teams. It works in conversations. It works in everything. So I call it a law. So that concludes today. And I remind you, we got AmpCon coming up. Go to ampcon.live, our Amplify conference. And uh, make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Share it if you liked it, if you found value out of it. Post it on social. Tag me. We'll comment. We'll connect that way. Follow us on Instagram, IG, uh, which is Renee Speak. Our YouTube channel, by the way, is really taking off. We're really having a fun time with that. And so find us, go to, go to, uh, get our newsletter, which, uh, is somehow attached to this, <laughs> go to my Instagram and go to actually the link tree and you'll see the newsletter. You'll see AmpCon, you'll see everything there, all the links. And, uh, yeah, please like subscribe, share, do all that stuff. And the book comes out April 26th, amplify your influence. We have been number one for weeks now on business communication. So we want to keep that going. We're going for wall street journal bestseller. So any help on that would be fantastic and much appreciated. Thank you all, and we'll see you next week.